Hello and welcome to DM It All, a show where we talk about D&D books and tabletop gaming history. In a previous episode, we explored the original Ravenloft, one of the most popular D&D modules of all time. D&D's publisher, TSR, obviously wanted to build off of Ravenloft's success, but saw no clear way to do so, as it was a self-contained story with few loose threads. Ravenloft, being an homage to the first half of Bram Stoker's Dracula, inherently suggested that Ravenloft 2 should adapt the second half. But in doing so, Ravenloft 2 twisted the lore to bring back Strahd von Zerovich, the main villain of the first module. It wasn't until AD&D's second edition that TSR decided to expand on the world beyond the villainous vampire. Since Ravenloft's dour, gothic horror setting was a large part of the reason it was so popular, TSR created an official world where similar stories could take place, complete with dramatic monsters in gloomy, mist-riddled villages. This led to the Ravenloft Realm of Terror box set, releasing in 1990. TSR created a lot of different settings during AD&D's second edition's lifespan, all in an attempt to replicate the surprise success of the Forgotten Realms. Ravenloft in particular was conjured up to appeal to the growing horror RPG market. Some of the most successful RPGs outside of D&D were horror systems, such as Call of Cthulhu and Chill. The influence of these rival companies is evidenced through their introduction of fear and horror checks in the Realm of Terror rule set. These were essentially adaptations of both Chill's fear checks and Call of Cthulhu's sanity checks, with adjustments made to have them function more like typical D&D saving throws. Fear checks represented sheer panic, while horror represented the wide variety of responses a character could have to a terrifying scene. This could include panic, as well as shock or blinding rage. Another response is extreme aversion, where characters steer clear of the source of their terror and even things that might remind them of it. They might even become obsessed, constantly replaying the encounter in their mind. The effects of horror usually lasted for one month, though they could get dulled by repeated exposure to similar scenes. The lead designers of the Realm of Terror box set were Bruce Nesmith and Andrea Hayday. Bruce Nesmith is likely better known as a senior game designer at Bethesda Game Studios, having worked as the lead designer on The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Nesmith joined TSR back in 1981 to work as a video game programmer, but was later moved to the tabletop division to become part of the Dragonlance team. He was eventually promoted to creative director in 1988, and designed several products for Ravenloft and other D&D settings. He eventually left TSR in 1995 to re-enter the video game market as a part of Bethesda. Our other co-author, Andrea Hede, is one of the founders of the Paysetter RPG Company. Paysetter was founded in 1984 by former TSR employees after a massive round of layoffs. They are best known for creating the chill RPG that the Ravenloft setting would later emulate. Hede continued to work with TSR on several projects, however, and was even in charge of the artistic design for the al Qadim setting. She would later collaborate with Nesmith one more time for the Dragon Strike board game, a simplified version of D&D meant to get new players into role-playing. Now, in order to cover the in-game origin of Ravenloft as a setting, we unfortunately have to spoil the backstory behind the first two modules of the same name, so consider this a warning. Ravenloft, or more accurately known as the Demiplane of Dread, fittingly rose to prominence through the actions of one Strahd von Zarevich. Strahd became a vampire because he was jealous of his younger brother Sergei. He wanted to be with Sergei's lover Tatiana, so he made a pact with death and signed it in his brother's blood. The original story was vague on how this pact functioned, but the Ravenloft box set reveals that Strahd had inadvertently opened a connection to the Demiplane of Dread. This locale is unique in that it has a mind of its own, thanks to an omnipresent force within the Demiplane known as the Dark Powers. The motive behind the Dark Powers is unknown, but they seem to be drawn toward evil individuals with grandiose personalities and violent ambitions. Now connected with Strahd, the Dark Powers translocated his castle to Ravenloft, along with the surrounding lands of Barovia. Additional foreign lands were drawn to Ravenloft over time, turning it into a patchwork of different disparate worlds. The borders of each territory are denoted by the Ravenloft Mists, which create a disorienting dream world for anyone that tries to pass through them. Each land also has its own unique method of preventing its inhabitants from leaving, such as the Poison Mists at the edge of Barovia. These custom borders are defined and controlled by the domain's respective Dark Lord, who can close off their domain whenever they wish. The designation of Dark Lord is a unique rank granted to powerful characters within Ravenloft, like Strahd. Although not technically a baron of Barovia, Strahd was unquestionably the most dominant denizen within the land. 
The Dark Powers bequeath a domain to each Dark Lord, but in exchange each Dark Lord is made to suffer poetic punishment based on their past history and ambition. In the case of Strahd von Zarevich, he is forever denied the love of Tatiana. When he first transformed into a vampire, Tatiana was so horrified by what he'd done that she leapt from the castle tower. Now the Dark Powers, cruel and insatiable, continuously reincarnate Tatiana within Barovia in order to taunt Strahd. The Vampire Lord always holds out hope that he can reunite with his beloved, but like sandcastles on a beach, these hopes are destined to be dashed before his very eyes, time after time. This is why the best description of the Ravenloft setting is like being trapped in a hell not meant for you. It's a torture dimension, custom built for an evil individual that just so happens to entangle and destroy the lives of other people within it. Though Strahd could be killed in the original Ravenloft module, second edition established that he and the other Dark Lords are endlessly resurrected by the Dark Powers so that their torment can continue on forever. Likewise, the Dark Lords inflict their own endless torment on the inhabitants of their domain, forming the unbreakable nihilistic cycle of despair that defines this setting. On a slightly lighter note, Many of the Dark Lords within Ravenloft are directly comparable to classic horror monsters, like how Strahd serves as an analogue to Dracula. The original Ravenloft box set introduced Victor Mordenheim as an homage to Victor Frankenstein, Frantishek Markov as an homage to the island of Dr. Moreau, and even Vlad Drakov as yet another homage to Dracula. Well, to be pedantic, he's an homage to Vlad the Impaler, the historical inspiration for Dracula. Other notable Dark Lords include Lord Wilfred Godfroy and the Lich Azalin, both of whom appeared in the Ravenloft 2 module. Of course, Realm of Terror added some retcons to Ravenloft 2 to better fit it into the broader Ravenloft pantheon. Azalin, for example, had become Strahd's unwilling servant, trapped within the realm of Barovia. He promised to help Strahd so that they could both learn how to escape the Demiplane of Dread. By studying the mists at the border, Aslan discovered a way to reach Mordenshire, the Victorian town from Ravenloft II. Aslan's escape attempt allowed him to pierce the veil, but was ultimately a failure, as Mordenshire is still a domain within Ravenloft. Local aristocrat Lord Godfroy was the Dark Lord of this area, condemned to this fate after murdering his wife and child in a fit of rage. The ghosts of his family drove him to his own death a year later, and now he lives on as a ghost of himself, continuously tormented by the haunts of his family on a nightly basis. Aslan realized that a strong personality could earn one the title of Dark Lord, so he wound up abandoning Strahd in the vain hope of ruling over his own domain. And his dark wish was granted. Aslan became the tyrannical king of Darkon, the largest domain in Ravenloft. But his pursuit of knowledge and power came at a price rendering him incapable of learning new spells of any kind. This retributive punishment by the Dark Powers is not exclusive to NPCs either. Any player character who performs needlessly evil acts in Ravenloft can also be promoted to Dark Lord. Evil acts in Ravenloft trigger a Dark Powers check, whereby the DM rolls a percentile die, checking to see if the results are somewhere between a 90 and 100. If successful, the character has caught the attention of the Dark Powers. They will grant their new victim unique abilities, all while slowly turning them into monsters. However, this transformation starts out small and can appear beneficial at first blush. For example, a character might get an increased run speed if they scamper on all fours, as well as the ability to attack with newfound claws and fangs. In exchange, they might develop more hair all over their body and other wolf-like features. A character can be granted such gifts six times by the Dark Powers before they transform into a Dark Lord. With each stage, the character will have a progressively harder time controlling their own actions, as their uninhibited desires bubble to the surface. They will start blacking out for days at a time before finally succumbing to their insatiable urges. The character then becomes an NPC controlled by the Dungeon Master, as well as a new Dark Lord within the game world. Additionally, Many D&D spells in Ravenloft actually trigger a Dark Powers check, especially those themed around death and pestilence. Included in this is Resurrection Magic, which now has a chance of creating undead monstrosities. Many holy effects, such as Turn Undead, are also weaker against the animated corpses of Ravenloft. Planar spells also saw major restrictions, ensuring that characters could not easily teleport the party out of the current domain. These changes made most spellcasters generally weaker within the realm of Ravenloft. Which makes sense, because horror RPGs tend to emphasize vulnerability, promising that any character can die at any moment. 
for this episode, we'll be discussing the first adventure to be released for the official Ravenloft setting. It's a 96-page module printed in the same year as the box set, and is often regarded as one of the better Ravenloft adventures outside of the original. This module was created by Blake Mobley, a game designer for TSR that worked for the company for a short period between 1990 and 1992. Apart from his work, there was little information on Mobley himself and what he did before and after his time at TSR. But nevertheless, we'll shine a spotlight on his most famous adventure, Feast of Goblins. As a word of warning, there will be spoilers in this module walkthrough. If you're a player interested in this adventure, we recommend you simply stop here and forward this video to your current dungeon master. Our final thoughts aren't spoiler free, so proceed with caution. The adventure begins with what will eventually become the standard introduction to Ravenloft. In the original module, the party had to be tricked into venturing into Barovia, but in the Ravenloft setting, its diabolical mist will often appear out of nowhere to kidnap unsuspecting travelers. The heroes will simply be walking down a misty road and suddenly find themselves in unfamiliar territory, unable to turn back. Since both the mists and the dark powers are unknowable enigmatic forces, any character from any realm can be whisked away. But not to fear, the mists will usually return characters back to their original dimension once they complete the mysterious mission they were abducted for. This makes Ravenloft Mists a convenient plot device for dungeon masters to use, forcing players onto a specific plot path they must complete in order to escape. Once the party is brought to Ravenloft, they will come across a large town where music pulses through the streets all day long. This is the town of Harmonia, a community comprised mostly of bards and musicians. The mayor of this town is even called the Maestersinger. Harmonia belongs to the greater land of Cardicus, located to the southwest of Barovia on the Ravenloft map. It will take a while for the party to learn this information, however, since they will be unable to understand any of the locals. Foreigners to Cardicus only have a 5% chance of understanding the local dialect, though the odds increase by 1% per day. It probably doesn't help that the people of Cardicus are reticent towards strangers either. The only person that will approach the party with any enthusiasm is the town constable. He demands the party's help and will threaten to arrest them should they refuse. The constable explains that an inmate has escaped his cell and needs to be subdued. Thankfully, the inmate has yet to flee the prison due to the system of portcullises used to lock down the various cell blocks. The constable tells the party that he'll control the portcullis system while they head inside to subdue the loose felon. He will also assign two prison guards to go at the party, which don't do much besides serve as useful cannon fodder. The heroes will have to wander this abandoned prison area, making sure to inspect each cell carefully. Eventually, they will come to a door at the end of the hall that has been torn asunder. Inside this room lurks a snarling, ferocious werewolf. Well, this is actually a Lou Garou to be more precise, the stronger version of the standard D&D werewolf created specifically for the Ravenloft setting. A were-superwolf, if you will. The constable knew all along that the inmate was a werewolf, which is why he sent the party in rather than risk battling the beast himself. Worse yet is that the constable will keep the party locked up even after they take care of his lupin problem. He will shut down the portcullis system, fearing that the party is now infected by the werewolf's curse. One has to wonder why he even asked for the party's help if he was afraid of creating more werewolves inside of his prison, but hey, maybe intelligence wasn't a prerequisite in the job description. The purpose of this imprisonment sequence is to make the party a literal captive audience for the next major event. Three days into their detainment, the group will overhear a woman being attacked in a nearby alley. Her assailant is a vicious man brandishing a whip, flanked by four massive wolves. After the thrashing, the man will eventually leave the woman crying in the alley, and the party is expected to reach out to her. She will introduce herself as Acriel and explain that her attacker is a jilted woodsman that demands her hand in marriage. But Acriel reveals that her heart belongs to a physician by the name of Dr. Dominiani. She claims that the only way they can be wed is by finding an artifact called the Crown of Soldiers. It was lost long ago by her ancestors, 
but a fortune teller has divined its location, and Acriel needs it to wed Dr. Dominiani, for some unspecified reason. The crown is hidden in a dungeon too dangerous for her to explore, so she is eager for help of any kind. If the party agrees to aid her, Acriel will use her connections with the jailer and mayor to release the party from prison. She'll direct the party north to the city of Scald, and promise to meet up with them at the old Kurtaken Inn within the week. Journeying northward, the party will encounter a potential side quest. A woman named Maria kneels weeping next to a freshly dug gravesite. She'll explain that two weeks ago, her husband Antosh was chased by a large animal near their farm. While he managed to escape, the creature broke his leg in the process. The family lived in fear for the next few days, huddled around the father, a blunderbuss cradled in his hands. Yes, guns indeed exist within the Ravenloft setting, as it drew its inspiration from the Victorian era, home to many popular gothic horror stories. The party can even find an indoor bathroom inside Antosh's home, complete with a sink and a toilet. The Demiplane of Dread may be home to innumerable horrors, but medieval plumbing is thankfully not one of them. Anyway, Antosh's oldest son eventually got tired of living in fear. He snatched his father's blunderbuss and tried to confront the creature outside. Hence, the freshly dug grave. The party can try to help the family by keeping watch during the night. The creature will stalk the farm grounds for the next three nights before it finally runs out of patience. It will send three wolves into the house in order to force the Antosh family outside. Afterwards, the creature will reveal itself as a werewolf, or something that looks like a werewolf. More on that later. When killed, the beast will transform back into a human. Antosh will then realize that the creature was actually their jealous neighbor Jacques. It turns out that Jacques was hoping to scare away Antosh's family so he could steal their land. This Scooby-Doo mystery does have some payoff, however, as there is some treasure in Jacques' house. Included here is also a strange list of names that includes Acriel, the woman that recruited the party for the Crown Fetch quest. Hmm, suspicious. Eventually, the player characters will reach Scald, the oldest city in Cardicus. It was constructed near a waterfall projecting a heavy mist, almost as if the river itself was boiling, prompting the first residents to name their settlement Scald. The old Cardican Inn is built on a small island next to this waterfall, shrouded in a constant haze of dense mist. When the party meets Acriel, she will inform them that the Crown of Soldiers is located east of Harmonia, the starting city, so the party will have to retrace their steps back to where they started. If the party decides to sleep at the old Cardican Inn to make the journey somewhat worth it, they can hang out in the common room and chat with the locals, who grow strangely rowdier as the night unfolds. Trying to leave the tavern will reveal that the doors are locked. The patrons then turn into wolf-like creatures and begin hunting our heroes. If the party is truly desperate, they can actually escape through the tunnels connected to the indoor toilet. Indoor plumbing for your hygiene and your health. If the party goes to bed before the wolf creatures reveal themselves, they'll instead be ambushed in their sleep. The entire inn is run by these wolf creatures, and each of the guest rooms feature a hidden door for easy access to snoozing prey. You'll notice we're avoiding the term werewolf, because these are in fact not werewolves, but wolf wares. That is, instead of a human that turns into a wolf, it's a wolf that turns into a human. One of the big differences is that wolf wares cannot spread their condition via bites or scratches, and they are generally more in control of their actions. Animal wares are not a new concept in AD&D, as the jackal wear was essentially the same idea and has been around since the original monster manual. Their wolf cousins were later introduced in a 1986 adventure called The Lost Caverns of Sojkanth. But Ravenloft fully embraces the inverse werewolf concept, as the land of Cardicus is entirely based around these creatures. Another major distinction between werewolves and wolf wares is that the latter typically transform into beautiful humans in order to lure victims into their den. They can also produce music that has a slowing effect on its victims, explaining why Cardicus is inhabited by so many bards and musicians. It's a land secretly dominated by the wolf wares. The greater wolf wares introduced in this module even have some levels in the bard class by default. However, it's very unlikely for the party to notice this unique theming, because they're likely to assume these are all just regular old lycanthropes. The distinction between the two is not immediately obvious, which is why all the wolf wares in Cardicus were changed to werewolves for the 5th edition version of Ravenloft.
Back on the hunt for the crown of soldiers, the party can head east to find a desolate canyon littered with skeletal remains, many of which have been propped up for display. Some of these remains are gigantic too, such as a ribcage that rises up 15 feet from the ground. As the party approaches the gorge, undead creatures will descend upon them, as well as deformed humanoids with large bulbous heads. These humanoids are called goblins, that is, goblins with a Y for an I. If players are told the title of this adventure, they'll probably assume they'll be fighting the short green goofballs from traditional D&D fare, but the Ravenloft setting likes to subvert player expectations, as evidenced by the wolfwares. Goblins are not the only creatures to be Ravenloftified, as there are also vampires, spelled similarly with a Y. Though these bloodsuckers lack the supernatural powers of the undead, they're also missing their typical weaknesses and remain fond of drinking their victims' blood. Monsters like these make sure that players can't really rely on prior D&D knowledge to survive, which is a good twist considering how much of horror relies on being wary of the unknown. While traditional D&D goblins are weak enough to be suitable enemies for level 1 adventurers, goblins, with a Y, are meant for characters around level 4. When a character first meets a Ravenloft goblin, they will have to pass a fear check when the goblin flashes their needle-like teeth. Characters will also have to pass a horror check when they first witness a goblin quote-unquote feasting. Feasting occurs when a goblin manages to hit a character with both of their claw attacks, Afterwards, the goblin will latch onto the victim and begin devouring their face. This not only causes extra damage, but said character will also suffer a permanent charisma penalty due to facial disfigurement. There are two dungeons in this canyon area, one to the south and one to the north. The southern dungeon leads into a system of caverns, with one of the earliest being a mist-filled chasm where giant bones function as makeshift bridges. Upon crossing over the bones, the party can spot corpses rising from the mist below. These are the phantoms of previous victims to this area, and they're dying for the party to join them. If the party fails the ensuing horror check, they have a chance of slipping off the bridge and getting impaled on a bone pile hidden below. Dying in this way will turn a character into another undead spirit doomed to haunt this gorge forever. This is but the first of many traps here. To the north stands a statue of a woman with nine arms and a snake-like body. Each of her hands holds a skull and she will telepathically dare the party into taking one. Touching a skull could cause a character to gain a unique undead power or die a painful death, all depending on which skull they pick. Near this area is also a pillar of mist that appears to kill anyone stepping through it. When a character disappears into the mist, a skeleton will shamble out shortly afterwards before collapsing to the ground. The pillar doesn't actually kill people, but instead teleports them to a nearby room to battle an undead monster with a hypnotizing voice. The skeletons that emerge from the mists are an animated decoy, meant to trick the remaining party members into thinking the pillar of mist dissolves one's flesh. If the party heads west, they will find the crown of soldiers resting atop a plinth. Taking the crown, however, will cause the surrounding hallway to cave in. Alas, this crown is a fake, and the party is now caught in a crumbling death trap. The party's only hope is to find a secret escape door before they are buried alive. This exit leads to a new series of caverns that wind even deeper into the dungeon. In the southern portion of these tunnels is a room guarded by eight skeletal warriors. After besting them, the party can find a secret door that leads to a sculpture of a skeleton with his hands cupped together. The engraving on the nearby wall reads, Place your life in my hands and I will show you the way. The player characters will have to pour blood onto the skeleton's palms, bringing it to life. It will emerge from the wall and begin casting a spell. If the skeleton is not interrupted, the room will fill with red mist as a magical gate emerges from the ground. Any character that passes through the gate will find themselves in a square chamber with an archway on each side. A large metal disc hangs over a pit in the center of the chamber, and on this disc is a skeleton wearing the real crown of soldiers. The party will need to climb the chains holding the disc in place in order to retrieve the crown. Any attempt to cheese this puzzle will cause the skeleton to toss the crown into the 50-foot pit below him. He will first dangle the crown over the edge as a warning to halt any and all shenanigans. This is to make sure at least one person is standing on the disc when the crown is removed. Taking the crown will cause the disc to collapse, leaving the victim with a split second to avoid tumbling into the pit. If any character manages to survive the 50-foot fall to the bottom, they will still have to contend with the undead beast lurking below. With the crown of soldiers finally in hand, 
The party can either head back to Acryl or continue exploring, heading to the northern dungeon, the Catacombs of Cardicus. Heading down the western path of the Catacombs will lead the party to a large stone slab, where a frail girl is chained up. Though it appears as if she has starved to death, she is very much alive and in need of rescuing. To do so, the party will have to magically heal her while destroying the slab she is chained to. Heading down the eastern path, we'll have the party venturing into a hallway coated in jet black mists. Passing through these mists prompt white hands to swipe at the party's items, which reduce them to nothing when touched. The mists also cast a slow effect to prolong the deterioration, making it likely that the party will lose a few valuable items no matter what. Past the black mist, the party will come across a massive room with a gargantuan skeleton at its center. A spiral staircase of bone has been erected inside the skeleton, leading up to its skull. Surrounding this calcified monument is a pit of eerie green mist that seems to sink into eternity. Any character that falls into this pit is magically held in place 30 feet beneath the mists. They can still be rescued should their friends attempt to do so, a bizarre mercy in an otherwise grisly adventure. Inside the giant skeleton's skull is a chamber bisected by a black curtain. This curtain depicts an embroidered image of a girl chained to a stone slab, reminiscent of the western section of this dungeon. On the other side of the curtain is a beautiful woman shackled, not to a slab, but a giant skeletal chair. If the party did not visit the room with the girl bound to the stone slab, this lady will lead them to that location when freed. Her goal in doing so is to take the most beautiful female party member and strap her to the slab. This is because the woman is actually a grizzled old hag that uses magic to siphon the beauty away from others. If the heroes have already visited the stone slab and seen her vile handiwork, the woman's chair will instead come to life, revealing itself to be a giant skeleton. This sets up a unique boss fight where the old hag hides inside the giant's ribcage while casting nefarious magic at the party. After the hag is slain, the heroes have six rounds to flee the skull, before the entire structure collapses into the green abyss below. The party will eventually have to venture back to the old Kartakan Inn if they plan to hand the crown over to Acreel. Hopefully during the daytime too, when the wolf words aren't roaming about. Acreel will inform the group that her unwanted suitor is still pursuing her and watching her every movement. Therefore, she will not be able to bring the crown of soldiers to her lover, Dr. Dominiani, as she originally intended. And in order to get married, the doctor needs the crown. If the party refuses, Acryl's stalker will send thugs to kidnap her until the party consents to her quest. If the party accepts, she will point them towards Dr. Dominiani's castle, located in an ancient domain to the north named Gundarak. A storm will roll in as the party approaches the castle, which hides the footfalls of three massive wolves prowling nearby. Additionally, distant wolf howls are heard during the entire length of the party's stay here. Further ahead, the imposing castle gates are marked with two iron wolf heads. These heads function as two-way speaking tubes that Dr. Dominiani uses to converse with visitors. If the player characters report their mission, the gates will open and two robed figures will lead them into the castle's main structure. The doctor himself is an immensely hairy man with a thick beard and bushy eyebrows. Some would say he looks almost wolf-like. Hmm, surely a coincidence. Stepping into his dining hall, Dr. Dominiani will treat the party to dinner, but will not partake of any of the food himself unless he is asked to do so. After dinner, the good doctor will invite the party to rest in his castle for the night. The following day, he will be missing from the castle, having left a note claiming to be busy with a patient in a neighboring town. He invites the party to explore his house in the meantime, which features some events we'll cover later. Eventually, Dominiani will return with a letter and pouch in hand, offering both to the party. The pouch contains a valuable gem meant to serve as the party's reward for handing over the crown of soldiers. But the letter is meant for Acriel's eyes only, something that might not strike the party as suspicious unless they decide to sneak a peek. When the party returns to the Cardican Inn for a third time, they may notice Acriel acting a bit differently. She claims to have discovered that Dr. Dominiani is actually a vampire named Doc Claude Heinfroth in disguise. 
No, not a werewolf, a vampire. She will implore the party to retrieve the crown and kill Dr. Dominiani if possible. If the party is diligent in their questioning, they can discover that this woman is actually an imposter. This is a man magically disguised as Acriel, who goes by the name of Harkon Lucas. Harkon Lucas is the Dark Lord of Cardicus, as well as the father of Acriel. It turns out, unsurprisingly, that both Acriel and her father are wolf wares. Lucas was an outcast among Lupin kind, so he instead sought to become a ruler among Homo sapiens. The Dark Powers granted Lucas his own domain, but Cardicus itself has little of consequence outside of some meager villages. Despite Lucas's pitiful fiefdom, his daughter Acryl yearns to usurp her father and take control of his domain. Lucas knows that his daughter is scheming against him, but is trying to uncover the means in which she plans to unseat him. Lucas will reveal that the Crown of Soldiers is in fact the Crown of Souls. It is a powerful artifact that must be kept out of Dr. Dominiani's hands, because the good doctor serves Duke Gundar. Duke Gundar is the tyrannical Dark Lord of the Gundarak Domain. He is an evil vampire that slaughters any citizen who fails to pay his draconian taxes. Of course, that doesn't mean that Lucas isn't a villain, as he is technically in charge of the Cardican Inn and the homicidal wolfwares that dwell within. Most of the wolfwares do not recognize Lucas as their leader, but they still adhere to some level of organization, hence the list of names in Jacques' house detailing the current members. To discover more about Lucas, the party can find his secret room hidden on the top floor of the inn. This is easier said than done, however, as Lucas has set up not one but two decoy bedrooms in order to divert his enemies. What the party has a better chance of finding is Acriel's room, which contains a letter written in an unusual language. Someone will need to cast Detect Magic or read the letter by the light of the moon in order to decipher the script. Dr. Dominiani's letter to Acriel is also penned in the same cryptic language and can be read the same way. These two documents detail Acriel's master plan. It turns out that some time ago, Dr. Dominiani approached Acriel with a scheme to overthrow Harkon Lucas and Duke Gundar at the same time. Their goal is to stoke a war between the two Dark Lords so that they end up destroying one another, allowing both Doctor and Daughter to become the new rulers of their respective domains. The Crown of Souls is an integral part of their plan, as it allows the holder to mutate humans into goblins using an evil incantation. By creating an army of goblins on the border between the two nations, Lucas and Gundar would suspect the other of this sudden aggression and respond by rallying their forces. Unbeknownst to Acriel, however, Dominiani is actually working with Duke Gundar to take down the wolfwares. The good doctor plans to kill Acriel when the time is right and seize Cardicus for himself. Acriel was unable to fetch the Crown of Souls on her own, as the surrounding canyon is filled with wolfsbane to ward off wolfwares. This is why she tricked the party into fetching the crown, and is also why Harkon Lucas cannot resolve the situation on his own. Oh, and there was never any jilted woodsman forcing Acriel into an unwanted marriage. The man that attacked her during her introduction was actually her father scolding her for meeting with the doctor. Wolfwares can't actually hurt each other without magic weapons, so Lucas was just battering his daughter for dramatic effect, we suppose. Acriel made up the woodsman's story on the spot to take advantage of the do-gooder nature of the adventuring party. Unfortunately, the player characters will be unable to confront Acriel with this groundbreaking information, as she doesn't show up in this adventure ever again. So instead, the party will have to return to Dominiani's keep and sneak back in. After clearing the castle gate, they might pass by the surrounding park area. Here, they will see numerous patients of Dr. Dominiani mindlessly shuffling about. Not only are these folks devoid of their mental faculties, but they all have two puncture marks on the back of their necks. The only way to help them is through magical healing, but unfortunately none of the patients will be able to remember what caused their curious condition. To find Dr. Dominiani, the party will need to seek out his coffin, because Dominiani actually is a vampire and utilizes wolf-like motifs in order to confuse his enemies. He has even trained himself to overcome his natural hatred of garlic in order to throw people off. Truly, a man dedicated to his ruse. Not only that, but you'd be hard-pressed to call him a normal vampire, as Dominiani prefers to suck on cerebral fluid rather than crimson blood. This is a unique attack that allows him to decrease a victim's intelligence by 1d6 with each bite. This is why his patients are so mindless and zombie-like. 
Well, aside from the patients that are literal zombies. Dominiani has covered these zombies with the magical oil in order to prevent their decomposition. So now they can pose as regular patients while secretly functioning as his undead servants. To find Dominiani's coffin, the party will have to navigate through multiple secret passageways. The first of these is a long shaft leading towards the basement. Partway through this shaft is an arrow slit overlooking a crypt. To get inside, the party will have to tear a hole into the wall, as the existing slit is too small for any creature larger than a bat. Within are two sarcophagi containing several chests, along with an inscribed warning. Whomever dares steal from the crypt will have a curse fall upon them and their descendants. While no such curse actually exists, the plunder here is not as beneficial as it may seem. A sword resting on one of the sarcophagi, for example, is a plus three sword against werewolves. However, Dominiani has altered this sword to be completely useless against vampires. There is also a cursed helmet in this location that has a chance of severing the head of its owner if an enemy rolls a natural 20. Still, it's worth nosing around in this area, as Dominiani's coffin rests beneath the false bottom of one of the sarcophagi. Should Dominiani suspect that the party has uncovered the location of this sleepulker, he will instead use a different coffin hidden beneath one of the castle towers. To find this spot, the party will have to discover a secret door inside of an already secret library room. The party should take care while traversing the castle grounds, as the devilish doctor has installed numerous traps throughout his castle. If the party visits the nearby chapel, for example, the main door will lock shut behind them. The only practical way to reopen the door is to investigate the blood-red coffin nearby. Anyone that tries to open it will be swallowed instantly by the casket. If others attack the coffin, it will bleed and mimic the screams of the victim inside. This is to discourage any interruptions, while the coffin transforms its terrified captive into a vampire. The party has only 10 rounds to rescue their friend before the vampirization is complete. After that, the victim will be released from the coffin, but will undergo dark powers checks on a daily basis. The most notable trap in this castle is a literal trap door, hidden in the castle tower opposite of Dominiani's spare coffin. When the party tries to lift this trap door, the floor will give way beneath them while a stone slab blocks the way they came in. It will take time to crack the stone slab, so the party will probably want to explore the underground area in the meantime, especially because this area contains a secret laboratory, which is yet another trap set up by Dr. Dominiani. If the heroes try to read the notes scattered on the floor, they'll spot the word DEATH written over and over again. The entrances to this room will then collapse as soon as the papers are disturbed. Once all of the entrances have been sealed, the party will meet a suffocating end. If the party manages to escape in time, they'll come across Dominiani's real laboratory located nearby. Here, they can read up on the doctor's findings regarding the Crown of Souls. Five hundred years ago, the Crown of Souls was forged by an evil necromancer by the name of Daglan Dagon. It was made for a powerful warlord, but as soon as the crown was completed and handed over, the warlord slew Daglan Dagon. Daglan, however, was prepared for this betrayal. The necromancer had placed his soul inside of the crown and attempted to possess the warlord as soon as the headdress was donned. But Daglan's spirit was not strong enough to overpower his foe, and so was left dormant inside of the diadem. One misty night, the warlord was ambushed by a band of elves. An elf managed to swipe the crown during the battle and place it on his head, rousing Daglan once more. The necromancer tried to possess the elf, but was thwarted again, this time by the dark powers. They not only brought the crown into Ravenloft, but also trapped the elf's soul within it. The name of the elf has been lost to time, but his spirit has been fighting for control of the crown ever since. However, it's only a matter of time before Daglan wins this battle, as his spirit grows stronger whenever one of his descendants perish. When his kindred fall, their spirits are summoned into the crown, adding to Daglan's force of will. And currently, Daglan has only one descendant left, a woman by the name of Radiga. To ensure his victory, Daglan struck a bargain with the Dark Powers to have Radiga brought to the Demiplane of Dread. 
but the Dark Powers, always a step ahead, arrange it so that when Radiga dies, she'll be transformed into an undead white. This effectively makes her immortal, keeping Daglan trapped inside of the Crown of Souls forever. Though she's alive at the start of this module, the party has a chance to personally kill Radiga should they venture into the seemingly optional dungeon in the canyon. Remember the hag that fights inside of the giant skeleton? Well, that was Radiga, and her demise at the party's hands will finally transform her into a white. Radiga herself is a vain, heartless woman who yearns for every man to be infatuated with her, unsatisfied with her paltry 17 charisma. When she was transported to Ravenloft, the dark powers fed into her narcissism, granting her extraordinary beauty, but only if she steals it from other women. Radiga turning into a white is not just a cruel joke on her ancestor, but also on Radiga herself. While her death fulfills the pact with the Dark Powers, turning her into an all-powerful Dark Lord complete with her own domain, her form will forever be that of a hideous white. Returning to the Cardican Inn, the party will be able to meet up with Harkon Lucas once again. He has been researching the Crown of Souls in the intervening time, and will fill in any knowledge gaps that the party might have. His new directive is for the party to destroy both Radiga and the Crown. He posits that the only way to do this without freeing Daglan is to kill Radiga's white while wearing the Crown of Souls. Unfortunately, by this time Radiga will have already fled her former dungeon. She has also given herself over to the Mists of Ravenloft, acquiring her own domain in the process, Daglan. Yes, it's indeed named after the ancestor that wants her dead, and is located at the southern border of Cardicus. Thirsting for revenge, Radiga will allow the party to enter her domain, but prevents them from leaving once they are inside. Daglan's main village is called Homlock, based on the former hometown of the ancient necromancer. But the Ravenloft version of Homlock comes with a new feature, a wall of skeletons protecting it. The bony barricade will come to life and attack the party should they try to approach the village. To get inside unscathed, the party can look for an opening or disguise themselves with robes similar to the ones worn by the local goblins. The most notable landmark in Homlock is a colossal column of mist overlooking the town. A cyclonic storm buffets the party should they try to approach it, preventing them from seeing what's inside. That is, the Mage Tower of Daglan himself. The Dark Powers are pulling it into Ravenloft brick by brick to prepare for the Necromancer's probable return. The town itself is a mostly desolate place, with the villagers having locked themselves away inside of their homes. The party can talk to them to learn more about Daglan, as according to the residents of Homlock, Daglan has only been dead for a couple of months, rather than the 500 years he's actually been gone. Eventually, the party will be drawn towards the local church, the current fortress for Radiga. The newly anointed Dark Lord has been anticipating the party's arrival, setting up ambushes all throughout the building. The entrance, for example, sees multiple robed figures banging on the walls of the church. These are secretly zombies in disguise, and are here to waylay the party should they try to escape. Dangling above the foyer are three hanging bodies that are also zombies incognito, biding their time until they can descend upon the party. Even the church's outhouse has been infested with large spiders. Indoor plumbing, now with 99% less giant spiders too. But the most dangerous area is the nearby crypt, where a demi-lich skull awaits. This particular demi-lich can transform characters into zombies if they fail their saving throw. And even if the party defeats the horrendous skull, its treasure will curse the first person to lay a finger on it. The cursed character will start multiclassing as a cleric, with their experience points split between their previous classes and the new cleric class. This represents the demi-lich's spirit inside of the character, and once they reach a 9th level cleric, the demi-lich will have grown strong enough to seize control of the host's body. Another one of the church's insidious traps is found early on. All the doors into the church have been coated with a slow-acting poison. Thankfully, this is not 1st edition AD&D, so the poison just deals damage rather than triggering instantaneous death. It's up to the DM to organize the final battle with Radiga, as the module does not place her in any one particular location. The most logical place for this final boss fight would be the main altar of the church, but this area already features Decoy White posing as Radiga. After defeating the real Radiga while wearing the Crown of Souls, the spirit of the nameless elf will emerge from the crown and thank the party for their efforts. The domain of Daglan will then tear itself apart in a flurry of storms, earthquakes, and volcanic eruptions. When the party next wakes, 
They will be back on their original plane, as if no time has passed. Almost as if this was all just a bad dream. We should note that even should the party fail to prevent the resurrection of Daglan, they will still manage to survive. What occurs instead is that Radiga's corpse turns into a goblin, controlled by Daglan Dagon. He will try to finish the party off, only to have his spell intercepted by the Crown of Souls. The heroes will then get sucked up into the same vortex that was summoning Daglan's tower. The party later awakens back home, like in the good ending, just without the full closure on what happened to Daglan, both domain and villain. A Feast of Goblins is a splendid introduction to the Ravenloft setting. It puts the players in the middle of a violent plot revolving around multiple Dark Lords, each with their own intention. It also showcases the creation of a new Ravenloft domain and Dark Lord. This adventure also offers up five different villains to play with, six if you count the largely absent Duke Gundar, Dr. Dominiani's boss. Gundar himself never made an appearance after this, as D&D's publishers probably realized that Ravenloft didn't eat yet another generic vampire. Instead, he was killed off-screen by the much more unique Dr. Dominiani, who received his own domain in a future adventure. Harkon Lucas and Acryl, on the other hand, became the most enduring personalities from this module, and are the only returning characters from this adventure in the 5th edition of the Ravenloft setting. A Feast of Goblins also acts as a useful resource for custom Ravenloft adventures, thanks to a huge chunk of background detail provided for Cardicus. One notable example is the Harmonia Amphitheater, which can lead to a side quest if the party opts to explore it. This famous landmark leads to an upscale tavern located within a complex series of caves. But this is yet another trap set by the wolf wares, who hunt their intoxicated prey as they drunkenly stumble through its labyrinthine tunnels. Another example of this module's attention to detail is in the town of Scald. Here, the party can explore a spot where meekle brow berries grow, berries used to create the most popular wine in the region. But these berries grow only in areas where someone has died a horrific death, an act that the wolfware vintners personally tend to. Details like this help add color to the region and its culture. A Feast of Goblins in general has a lot of flavor text, which works perfectly for a gothic horror adventure. The entire prison area at the start, for example, mostly exists to build tension as the party slowly crawls through it, discovering more and more signs of a gory struggle. Despite being a mostly narrative experience, the prison area also comes with a complete dungeon map. In fact, this adventure has so many maps that it almost feels indulgent. Even the Ontosh family side quest gets not one but two pages of maps, despite hosting just one encounter. Then there's the Old Cardican Inn, which acts as a 30-room dungeon. The party is unlikely to see most of it, however, as the plot is rigidly linear. The main narrative constantly leads the party from point A to point B, and then back to point A again for some fairly weak reasons. While there are built-in contingencies for what might happen should the players steer off the beaten trail, we find these emergency scenarios to be less of an if case and more of a when. This is because the plot itself has so many nonsensical elements that it's unlikely the party will follow the intended path plotted in our video. The main problem is that the party is expected to trust Acriel when her cover story is immediately suspicious. Acriel claims to be dealing with a rather simple lover's quarrel, but her only solution is to explore a deadly dungeon to find an ancient MacGuffin. Acriel doesn't explain what the Crown of Soldiers is, or even how it is supposed to help her. The party is just expected to retrieve it and hand it over, with no questions asked. Not to mention that all a character has to do to discover the crown's true nature is put it on their head. Doing so will shift the character's alignment one step closer toward evil unless they pass a saving throw. Ignoring this portent and keeping the crown on will eventually allow Daglan to permanently control their body. Acriel will also refuse to entertain any other suggestions, including less convoluted ones, like personally protecting her from the woodsman or subduing the woodsman himself. There isn't any information the heroes can gather about this mysterious woodsman should they query the townsfolk either. So the only option for aiding Acriel is to venture into a dangerous dungeon and hand over an obviously evil artifact. 
We believe that it's simply too easy for players to poke holes in Akriel's story, and worse yet, the Dungeon Master isn't provided decent excuses to maintain the multi-session facade. There are contingencies included if Akriel's plan falls through, such as Harkon Lucas attempting to recruit the party should his daughter fail to do so, but this is a half-baked suggestion for the Dungeon Master in a book loaded with pages upon pages of content solely devoted to Akriel's storyline. And let's not forget that halfway through the adventure, she straight up vanishes, robbing the party of any kind of closure. Consequently, the DM will probably have to rewrite one or more major events in this adventure, especially with more, shall we say, aggressive adventuring parties. Even ignoring the Akril cover story, the narrative as a whole requires the heroes to act against their own interest in some truly moronic ways. The entire prison sequence, for example, involves the party trying to recapture someone already trapped inside of a jail cell. The party is also expected to keep venturing back to the old Cardican Inn to meet with Akriel, despite learning of its wolfware infestation pretty early on. It might be strange to recommend an adventure while criticizing the logic of its plot, but A Feast of Goblins has a lot of great aspects besides the main story. The lore, prose, maps, locations, and traps are worth a gander, just don't expect it to run as well as it is written.